Hey, everybody, along with the Cup winner, Mike Commodore, and the Calder winner, uh, Andrew Raycroft. I'm James Sabalski. It's the Clearing the Crease podcast powered by Bodog.eu, and we've got a fun one coming up. Uh, he is immortalized on a stamp in Sweden. He's an Olympic silver medalist, and he is uh, a best-selling author as well. This guy checks all the boxes, and uh, a guy I worked with for several years as well. Talking about Corey Hirsch is coming up in just a few moments. And hey, just a quick reminder, everybody, we are officially on the road to the Stanley Cup. Make sure you make a play. Get in all the action, all the game odds, all the props you will need to make hockey exciting every single night, including goal scores. And yes, Stanley Cup odds. Bodog.eu has you covered with action that'll keep you locked in every single shift right until that cup is hoisted. So make a play and score big with Bodog. Boys, how are we feeling these days? I mean, we're kind of feeling like springs in the air. We're getting that playoff weather. Razor, you're in Beantown. You know, everybody's amped up for a cup run. Razor, everybody's ready to go golfing in Arizona. But Razor, why don't we start with you in Boston? How's life going over there? Beautiful. We're finally getting some sun. We're finally seeing some grass grow. The golf course opens Friday at noon. So I will be out there Friday wow. afternoon. That's exciting. Wow, that's um, exciting. And, uh, yeah, and then it's just cranking with college hockey here in New England and, and the Bruins and the run. So busy couple weeks here for me, um, but but all exciting because the golf courses are opening. There you go. That's a true sign of spring in the air, Kami. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm a little, it's a little different down here for me. Uh, you're, you're pretty spoiled in Arizona, right? So it's like when spring starts coming, you know, it's – it's sunny here all the time. So when spring starts coming, it's like, oh, shit, summer's around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Which means I could be getting in my truck and driving north again. But, uh, no, a little bit of golf and exciting that the playoffs are, are coming around. And uh, so, yeah, no, it's kind of – and you never look at the forecast here. It's it's pretty easy living down here. So We just had, we just had our first taste of, like, warm weather here <laughs> in Metro Vancouver for the first time in four months. And it's funny because – where we are, it's like a barren wasteland for four months. Like everybody hibernates or anybody with money, all the seniors, they all screw off to Hawaii or Mexico for, for months or weeks on end, right? All of a sudden, we get like nice sunny weather here over the last few days. And the neighborhood is packed. Everybody's out, right? People with dogs, people with kids running around. It's like, where did all these people come from? I haven't seen a soul for the last four months. And all of a sudden... The clouds part, the sun uh, actually comes out and it reminds everybody that it's actually out there. So we'll take it as a win. People yes. golfing and all of it. So uh, why don't we uh, why don't we get a Corey here into the mix here and uh, and bring in Hershey. There yeah. he is, a best-selling author, an yes. Olympics medalist, your friend and ours, Corey Hirsch. How are you, Hershey? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. It uh, We've been connecting back and forth and um, it's good to see you, Razor, Kami. Uh, I just was going through some of your hockey DB. Um, Kami, you may have played for more teams than I did, and that's that's pretty <laughs> hard to do. Razor, you're pretty close. Yeah, Between the three of us, we're probably about 40, 45 teams. We're 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 tight on that. We're tight. Yeah, we on got that. a high percentage of the, uh, of teams covered, I think, between the three of us. <laughs> there isn't much, there isn't Kami, much in that league. There's a few, but not many. I was looking at yours, Kami, and I'm like. Jesus Christ, the cities that you played in, could you have played at any like better cities than that? Like Albany, Lowell. I'm not, you know, not making fun of those. They're a lot of fun, but the sun doesn't shine much in those places in the no, winter. No, no. Albany was always dressed like a seat night. There was never no anybody at the games. <laughs> Jersey, I lived in a motel. Uh <laughs> Lowell, Lowell, or Lowell, thank God, was good for my time in my career because I needed to, you know, I was having a little bit too much fun at night. And there was <laughs> Nothing going on at night in Lowell. The nicest rink, or like the nicest building in town, was the rink. So that actually came at a great time. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Fourteen, yeah. Teams in 14 years, Hershey. So I played with you in Albany for a short stint. Yeah. If, you if you don't recall, I, I do. Got, uh, you guys were um, together. Yeah. Yeah. We, briefly, we lost like 25 in a row. So they brought me in. <laughs> and then we, I probably helped them lose five more in a row. Get that goals but, against average up. We were so <laughs> bad. It was definitely not the goalie's fault. I'll tell you that right now. John Cunniff had me staying at the Hojo, the Howard Johnson. Yeah. And it was like, I mean, it was low, like, they were like mice and, and uh, cockroaches. Like, it was like low end, but that team saved a little money, you know, and I contributed to five more losses. Uh, Razor, <laughs> you played some good places too, didn't you, Razor? 
Yeah, I had a good, I had, I had a pretty good setup uh, with Providence was as good as it got in the minors. And then of course, moving Toronto and Vancouver and Denver. And so I, I picked well when I was a free agent, babe, I probably should have picked better for my professional career rather than where my wife wanted to live. But no, <laughs> so be, I remember that Albany river rats team too. I played a few of those. Finally, the only team we won, I think against was that team in Albany. Oh, man, we wait, wait, Hershey, did team. you and racer come across at the same time? I in I Toronto. Don't know you Were you in Toronto at the same time? Well, I was goalie coach there. I had Cujo and uh, Vesa Toscala. And, mm. and Cujo was at the end of his career. Uh, Cliff Fletcher just signed him because uh, Cujo wanted to come home, be closer to his family. I think he was going through a divorce. And uh, Cujo was like, I'm like 33, and I was goalie coaching Cujo. He's like 38, 39, way better goalie than I ever was, right? <laughs> And I'm his goalie coach. I'm like, Cujo, what do you want to do today? You know? Yeah, right. carry the clubs. <laughs> really carry the did. clubs for him. Put the pucks out Vesta there for him. <laughs> yeah, Vesta didn't give a shit about anything. So it was like, all right, I guess I'm just going to – I don't even know what to do here. So that was my time in Toronto. Yeah, good times. Good times. Since we're on the uh, – before we get started on something else, I, I, this is a question I had for you because I, I don't think I've ever asked anybody this, and I should have. Speaking of teams that we used to play for, you played in Utah. And that's kind of come up recently with that Ryan Smith or whatever, potentially maybe moving the Coyotes there if they don't get the land auction and whatnot. Did you? I, I played against Utah with that when I was in Cincinnati. I actually might have played a game or two against you then, uh, but it wouldn't have been in Utah. I've never played hockey in Utah. That was just when uh, I just missed it for whatever reason. Did you enjoy it there? Like. I know it's a long time ago. Do you think it would work there? I know the setup would be different, but I guess what general thoughts on Salt Lake in general? With one hundred percent, they should go there. What a great place to play! Well, uh, oh, it was okay. it was beautiful. Uh, people are awesome. A um, little bit of the religious vibe, right? I mean, so yeah. if, if guys can deal with that or whatever, and that's okay. I mean, whatever. You know, there's no no judgment here. But um, as far as the city goes. Uh, it's probably one of the best cities that I played in. I, I could have just shacked up and lived there. I'd have no problems skiing. Everything is people were good. Um, I don't know what the building's like. They got a new building, I'm sure. But 100 percent, the NHL should go into Salt Lake City. I am. It would be guys would love to play there. It's a it's a really it's a great place to play. Um, good fans. Uh, I, I loved it. And I don't know. Razor, did you play in the old uh, um what what was it? Not the AHL, but what, what was it? It was the uh, how can I forget the, the IHL? IHL? The IHL, yeah. I didn't yeah. do the IHL. I missed it. I missed out on the IHL. Um, that was the set that this that was the last year was my first year pro when you guys were in Albany. Um, that was in Providence that year, so no crossover. Didn't get to do the Vegas uh, Utah trips. Oh, yeah, that, that was, was a good great. Yeah, yeah really exactly. Good. Well, absolutely yeah, the, the international league kind of had it well before the the nhl right like look at some of those west coast cities san diego with the goals oh, it's amazing and the city i heard was pretty tucson sick, you know? i think and yeah and, and, and guys are at the end of their careers typically playing in the eye right so they i mean it was just every night was like just a you went out every night it was it was so much fun like Hershey, you, played you, played in, each, you know played in cincinnati were you guys when you were there was that rink down? Well, yeah. Uh, so I played in Cincinnati too, but for the American League team, and we played in the. There was an East Coast League team there called the Cincinnati Cyclones. The yeah. Cincinnati Cyclones played in the nice rink downtown. The American yeah. League team, which is supposed to, you know, a little higher level hockey or you know, one little step up or whatever, was playing in the hood down in Norwood. When you yeah. were with the Cyclones, did they have that rink down down on the river? They did, and nobody showed up. Like nobody went to the games. It was, oh. uh, it was dead. But what a great city that is! Like they, yeah. that should be where they should put an NHL team. Is in Cincinnati. That, that's a that's a great place to play. I I, I loved it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I and what a like just a great place to go out in and have fun. Um, Kami, I, I did want to ask you. Uh, I'm doing the interview now, by the way, so I'm going to interview. Right. This is the best way to do it. This is the best way. This is the best guest we've had. Saves us <laughs> asking <laughs> shitty questions. <laughs> you have a great story from your time in Russia. I don't know if you know the one I'm talking about. If you can tell it, where I think you got in some kind of bar fight or something. Like you got. Oh you yeah, know? yeah. You got to tell that story. Have you told it on air yet? No, he's uh, always holding out on us on these. Oh, stories. this is the best story ever. Can you tell it? Uh, yeah, no, I definitely can. I, yeah, I don't think I have told it on our podcast. Yeah, no, it was um, it was towards the end of the year to just to set up kind of how it was set up. We it was towards the end of the year, right before the Olympic break, we had a month off 
for, for the <laughs> Sochi Olympics. So we were on the road, then we were coming back. Uh, and then we had, because our rink wasn't ready. Anyways, we had our last like seven games straight. We're all at home because we had to play on the road at the beginning of the year because our rink wasn't ready because it was a brand new team. Um, and we needed to win like seven or we need to win like five or six of these things in regulation because they were on the, which I think is a better format personally, the three points for a regulation win. I think you should be rewarded for winning in regulation. Mm. Anyways, uh, so we were out playing. I think we played like the Red Army and then we had another. Now, by this time, I'd, I'd been there for four or five months. So I kind of knew what was coming. We got our 10 hour flight from Moscow back across the country. Going to be jet lagged. Sleep's going to come at odd times. So I get back and. It was like, I don't know, five o'clock at night. And uh, I'm like, man, I'm exhausted. But I'm like, man, I can't go to bed. I go to bed at five. I'm going to be up at midnight. So I'm kind of just sitting in my apartment. And a couple of the Russians guys are like, you want to go to dinner? I'm like, perfect. Get me out of the apartment. Like, it's not like I wandered around Vladivostok. Nobody spoke English. So I didn't really have much to do. So we go to this place, French Brasserie, or the Brasserie, sorry, it was called. It was a French restaurant. Like North American standards, this place was awesome. It was like five star restaurant. Like North, it was it was very very nice. So this is like six o'clock at night, maybe sun's still up. We're going for dinner. There's three of us, and we go into this dinner, sit down, and you know we end up having. I probably ended up having a few too many beers and not nearly enough food. Like I think I might have had half a salad, and I was just smashing beers. You know, I was excited to be out of the house. So. <laughs> Anyways, get a good buzz with the guys and the restaurants busy. I'm like, man, this place is nice, but you know, there's not isn't much English. One of the guys I was with played some games in Ottawa, Ilya Zubov. So he spoke English. The other guy was a young guy, an 18 year old, no English. So we're having a pretty good time. And after this, now it's like I don't know, seven thirty, eight o'clock, maybe. Um, you know, it's time to go. We're gonna go to this place called the Music Bar, which literally, other than maybe Russian Christmas. It's open 24-7 every day of the year. Like, this place does not close. And I've been there a few times before. I'm like, yeah, let's go. So from my recollection, I pay the bill. And one of the guys went to the bathroom. Ilya went to talk to somebody or something. I don't know. I pay the bill. I get up. And I'm just walking out of the restaurant. For the life of me, I, I, I didn't say anything. I'm not like that anyways. It's not like I, when I get drunk, I try and start fights. I've never been like that ever in my life. B... I don't know how the hell I would try and start a fight with, like, I'm not going to say anything to anybody. Nobody speaks English, so I can't communicate with them. <laughs> but I kind of go around. There's a little brick entrance to get, for, like, you know, kind of out of the restaurant. Next thing I know, I am shoved up against the wall and getting my lunch fed to me by two Russians, two younger, probably like 25-year-old guys, something like that, are, like, pounding me. So I'm like, tuck my chin. First off, I'm like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> I like tuck my chin because I don't want to get knocked out. And I'm like, you know, when this adrenaline hits and now, you know, as far as I'm concerned, like this is, I'm fighting for my life. I don't know if these guys have a knife or anything like this. So anyways, I'm up against the wall. And so I kind of grab one guy, kind of hold him out a little bit and shove the guy that's like just smoking me from the side. So he kind of stumbles back. And I grabbed the guy, or I still have a hold of the guy in front of me, and I I gave it to him pretty good real quickly. And, like, I smash his nose. His buddy comes back, grabs on me, pulls me. So I grab the guy I got. We all go, moral of the story is, we all go flying back into this packed restaurant and, like, right into a table. And it is, like, on. So people are screaming, running out. I'm throwing chairs. There's cutlery flying. So like these guys would come in, and we go flying over another table. I throw a chair. Anyways, you know, I hit these guys a couple times. I am definitely taking damage too. We're going around the restaurant. Like I said, the place clears out. So this, I mean, it probably only went on for a couple minutes maximum. This, and nobody yeah. stepped in. So not not right away. The fight ended, so I'm laying on the ground. There's so there's a, I'm in a the guy's got me in a chokehold. I'm laying on top of him. We're on the ground, and his buddy's booting me in the head, and I'm trying to like reverse headbutt the guy. And Ilya, Ilya, I found out next day the 18 year old came out of the washroom, saw me leaning into somebody, panicked, and he just ran out the back door, which I totally understand because this kid would have got. He couldn't get associated with this. They would have booted his ass off the team. Teammates. Team I get that. I was like, you know what? No problem. I understand. Okay. Ilya jumps on this guy's back as he's kicking me or whatever. Anyway, sirens go off. Cops are outside. 
this guy lets me go and these guys disappear. They're gone out the back door or whatever. And so I'm like, I'm laying on the ground. I'm like, holy shit. Like, what the <laughs> fuck just happened? But I like pick myself up off the floor and I like, I wish I would have taken like, a, I think I said this, like I should have taken like a panoramic picture. Cause like the, nothing was like broken, broken, but like tables flipped, cutlery everywhere, chairs everywhere. The staff was huddled in the back corner, like horrified. And so I'm like looking around like, what the fuck? we we'll walk outside. <laughs> thrown in cuffs, thrown in the back of the cop car. Ilya jumps in there with me. We go over to the police station. They throw me in jail. Like in the, well, I guess it's not jail, but whatever. Prison cells in the in the cop, in the police station. And there's no English. Ilya's on the phone calling his mafia buddies trying to figure this out. I'm just sitting in there. I'm sitting there for like two hours. It's me and like 20 Mongolian looking dudes. I'm like, <laughs> man, I should not be in here. Like, this is not good. So as I'm sitting in there, there's this dude in a leather jacket kind of darker skin a little bit, leather jacket. He kind of, he's walking every 10 minutes or so. He's like walking by the, the, the prison bars and he's like kind of looking at me. And I just figured he was an undercover cop. I mean, we're right in the middle of a police station. And after a few times he walks by and stops at the door and, and we, through the bar, he's like Misha, which is Michael in Russian. I'm like, da. And he just opens up the, opens up the door and he's like this. And I'm like, Okay. So I get up, I walk to him. He's like, I walk, we walk right out the front door of the police station, right down, and he takes me to the bar. This guy wasn't a cop. He was like a mafia guy. So I just walk right out the front door. As I'm walking out, I'm walking down the stairs. Our crooked, like one of our sport directors for the team is coming up the stairs. He speaks no English. I just wave at him like this, and this guy <laughs> takes me back to the bar. I got a picture with the guy in the bar. We went to the music <laughs> bar. Anyways, I ended up getting a big meeting the next day. They want to kick me off the team. I'm like, fine, kick me off the team. I'm like, good luck winning the next five or seven games. I'm like, I actually play a decent amount. Like, whatever. <laughs> I'm going through McGillney, a translator, Alexander McGillney. It's like, you shouldn't have been doing that. I'm like, what do you want me to do, Alex? Not go to dinner? I'm like, this didn't happen at two in the morning. And so, anyways, long story short, they don't kick me off the team. They find me a month's pay. So I'm like, you know, I do the quick math. I'm like a month. I was making 40 grand cash. I'm like a month's pay. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I got jumped. So then like, <laughs> one of the other sport directors was a gangster with prison tattoos all over his face oh. and hand, not face, sorry, on his hands. And uh, he liked me. So in Russian gets up and he's like, you know what? If you make, you give us $40,000 cash. It was like 750,000 rubles or something cash. I got to get him, which is a whole nother experience, but I'll save that for later. And so I had to, if you guys make the playoffs, I'll give your money back. I'm like, you know, I do kind of want to see this through. And so I'm like, I ain't giving my money back. Well, you know, there's no way, but I'm like, <laughs> okay, deal. So I go get the money the next day. Russians care about two things, rubles and not being embarrassed in front of women. That was one thing I learned over there. Those two things they care deeply about. So I get the cash. We end up winning our last game. We make the playoffs. Everybody's going crazy in the rink. I'm in the dressing room yelling, where the fuck are my rubles? I want my rubles. <laughs> <laughs> and to their credit, they kept, in American dollars, they kept $3,000 worth of rubles to buy the police some new TVs, and the rest I got back. So it all worked out. Hey. Oh, my God. That is that. Like <laughs> Yeah, was the the restaurant didn't send you a bill. I remember he was oh. telling me, and I'm just like, "You're fucking kidding me! This is this is like a movie. This is like <laughs> a real western." It was crazy. Oh. It ended up going on too. Like, like I said, I got a message on Twitter from somebody, like some very vague from like a random account. Like, how could an athlete do this? And I'm like, oh. "What the fuck happened?" I'm like, "I didn't do anything. I just protected myself." And then. I had heard up to a couple years later, like I'm sure it's over now, but a couple years later, I got a message from Ilya on WhatsApp and he's like, man, these guys are still trying to press charges against you. I'm like, I guess I ain't coming back to the West Coast reunion. I ain't setting foot in Russia again. Like, who was it? Was it like Russian mafia or was it just two dudes that saw some American guy or Canadian and fucking just wanted money? Is that? My guess would be it was just two 20-something year olds Maybe they heard me speak in English in the restaurant and they just either maybe they didn't like Americans or Canadians or they thought money. I don't know what the fuck they were doing. My, my Russia story isn't quite as good as yours, but if you want to hear it, I'll let you, I'll tell it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're in, we're in. Right ahead. 
So we're I, I'm with the World Juniors and I was coaching and uh, we're in Moscow and uh, we ended up going to a bar and we're that's about midnight and I'm like I'd only had a couple of beers wasn't was liquored up or anything. But uh, Hershey, what year are we looking at here? This is like 2000. And remember the they redid the 1972 series with World Junior players. So this is like 2008 ish. Yeah. Um, so I had a couple beers and uh, um, uh, Craig Hartsburg and, and Brad Pascal were all like, let's just go back to the hotel. So we're going to walk back to the hotel. So as we're walking back to the hotel, I, I mean, I got to have a, like I've had a couple of beers. I got I got to piss, but there's nowhere to go. So I go behind this building and, and I'm, I'm like, you know, going peeing and whatever. And I go to pull up my pants. This van pulls up like a Winnebago. Six guys jump out, grab me. I'm like doing up my zipper, right? Throw me in the back of this van. It's dark, right? And this guy, this guy in the back of the van leans forward and goes, passport, passport. And I'm like, I don't, I don't have my passport, right? I'm thinking I'm going to get fucking kidnapped. So as Kami says, uh, money, money talks. So I open up my wallet. I've got like 300 us American in my wallet. He grabs it out of my wallet. The guys grab me, throw me out of the van onto the sidewalk and take off. And they had like face <laughs> hats on and, and Hartsey and, and Brad Pasco were like going, Hershey, we thought you were fucking gone. Like you were getting kidnapped. And I was like, Holy shit. You know? And then did you think they helped me at all? Fuck no. They were, they were like, they were gone. They, God, you know, yeah. Buddies, right. See you, Hershey. Yeah, but see you later. Got to find a new coach. It's the Wild West, hey? Like, it's fucking... Yeah. My last yeah. rush of Sir, while I'm thinking about oh, this. Yeah, we should have him on is Jonathan Taves. So this yeah. was 2007, so right around... I was playing in the Worlds. And so... the Because it was in Moscow. I was actually grateful because it was in Moscow. None of the good defensemen wanted to go. So Steve went... Steve Eisen went far enough down the list where finally I was invited. And I was kind of like in the peak of my career. And so he's like, you know, it's in Moscow. I'm like, do you want to go? I'm like, I don't give a shit where it is. Like, I'll go. So long story short, that was the year that Jonathan Taves, so Jonathan Taves, North Dakota guy, that was the year where he won the World Juniors and the men's. So he was playing with us. Hershey, Hershey and I stood next to each other for that shootout at the World yeah. Juniors with Taves. Yeah, that was Taves amazing what he did. Crazy. And he was a great player. Like, when I went over there, the North Dakota coaches were like, hey, you know, try and get Jonathan to come back to UND. We both went to North Dakota. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, sure. I like see this kid play one game. I'm like, hey, look, his parents were there too. And I'm like, hey, look, like I'm supposed to sit here and convince you guys like to go back to North Dakota. I'm like, look, I go, you're ready now, hockey wise. I'm like, my only advice would be like, go when you're ready. Like, obviously the injury is always a risk, but like, you know, if you want to go back to college, we'll go back to college, but I'm not going to sit here and try and tell you like, you're not ready to turn pro. Um, but then Jonathan's a very wholesome guy. He was young at the time or whatever. So we all do it. Every time we did a team dinner in Russia, it was a team thing. We get the bus and a police escort to take us to a restaurant every, anytime we went anywhere. Otherwise you couldn't fucking get anywhere in that city. So we go to this place, a restaurant, have a little team dinner or whatever. And we're kind of walking out and I kind of stayed back just, you know, kind of not make sure, but just kind of keeping an eye on things. And I would keep an eye on Johnny just because, because North Dakota, I felt. You know, I just kept an eye on him. And so we're walking out, and I'm right behind him. And there's this little, right by the front, uh, the, the hostess stand, another nice restaurant. There's this little dude. Like, this guy couldn't have been much more than 5'4", in, like, an impeccable suit, real slick looking, like, just berating this woman. Berating her, like, yelling at her in Russian. All of a sudden, he hauls off and just smacks her. Like open hand or whatever, and I'm like, Jesus. And no, sorry, I got that wrong. He's yelling at this broad, doesn't hit her. My bad. He's yelling at this broad, and she's like just standing there. He's whatever, hands are flying. John, I see Johnny in front of me. Johnny sees this and like veers off towards him. And like, I'm like, uh oh. And Johnny like taps the guy on the shoulder, like wanted to tell him to stop, obviously. That ain't going to go well, and he can't understand you anyways. So he, like, kind of taps him on the shoulder. The guy turns around and looks at him. Johnny's, like, saying something. I don't know what the hell he was saying. This guy, I got the smack wrong. This guy hauls off and just open hand slaps Jonathan Taves oh. right across the face. Oh, yeah. And I mean hard. 5-4. Like, oh, yeah. Oh. And I mean, this guy just kaboom right, right here. Johnny's like... Face goes flying. I'm standing there. I'm like, oh, Jesus. So the guy kind of follows through. 
I kind of walk up there. I push Johnny towards the door. I grab this guy by his belt and the top of his like suit jacket, <laughs> and I just ram this guy right into the wall, head first, like as hard as I can. Shane Doan was still inside. He was our captain. I'm like, we got. I go donor. I yell at donor. I go now. Let's go. So we go outside, and I'm like on the bus. We all get on the bus, and we got the fuck out. Of <laughs> I've never heard another thing about that. Unbelievable. Yeah, I'm like, hey, Johnny, let's, oh just, my let's God. just leave the locals to do their own thing here. We aren't the, we aren't the morality police. So, anyways. Oh he still God. remembers it to this day. I saw Johnny on the golf course here. Like, I, you know, I don't see him very often, but at all. Um, but anyways, how yeah, did you forget that story? If somebody paint brushes you that right. hard, that's five foot nothing. And yeah, Johnny had a lot of things going on. And yeah, I was, he did remember though. It was, I will never forget that. Like I've never seen somebody get slapped that hard. It was actually pretty impressive. <laughs> and like an open hand slap, an open hand slap, like even more so than a punch because it's loud, right? There's a sound effect to a, like yeah. a punch, a punch is a punch, more of a, more of a thud where an open hand slap like everybody hears an open hand slap and right? on a guy it's like kind of like it's like kind of i don't know if it's, <laughs> yeah. it's degrading it's oh no it's insulting man. Almost, it's humiliating. Yeah, it's insulting. you get an open hand almost slap. Get drilled with a punch yeah. than, like slapped is like <laughs> what did, what did taser know. what did taser do like did he do anything or did was he just a, a, a bystander in the wrong he was, place he was just rock. going up and he tapped the guy and i think he just wanted he was oh. he was trying to tell the guy to calm down is what i think he was yeah. doing because the guy was just screaming like screaming at this broad and he was like trying to just be a good dude and like calm down you shouldn't yell at women or whatever yeah. <laughs> this guy wasn't having it he yeah, was not a gentleman wow. <laughs> jonathan he's being a say. gentleman right yeah yeah oh, wait, wait, wait. He was Razor, you're up. Come on, give us a story. <laughs> I should have went to Russia. I wanted to go to Russia just no, for that. Should I should have went to Russia. No, you shouldn't have. I've been there enough times. <laughs> right? My God, those are great stories. It's the <laughs> Commodore Hour right now. I love it. <laughs> I love it. So I got another commie story. So commie, do you remember we met in Scottsdale? We were just yeah. talking about some stuff. And yeah. I was asking him all about, uh, it's really, a, but you were, you were an Uber driver. Yes. And I was like, why are you an Uber driver? You're like, it's a great way to meet chicks, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. I might start doing it again as well. Oh, <laughs> my God. That's so I, I tell you what, this Uber driving now these days, like everything else, everything else has gotten more expensive. I'm telling you what, it might be. You get, a black, you get one of those shit. black Suburbans, you make some real money doing that. Seriously, and it's a great way. Like, you want to get out of the house yeah. and, you know, you want to meet some people or whatever, get out of the house. But, you know, you don't want to drink or you don't want to go to the bar or whatever. It's a great way to do it, actually. Now, you're going to get some rides that you're like, that's the one thing here, Hershey, I think I probably told you that, is like, yeah. it would be awesome if it was like parameters. Like, you know, I could, you could only drive in Scottsdale and within like 10 minutes of Scottsdale or something. But like there were times where I'd, I'd pick somebody up, I'd pick up a couple of pilots at the Scottsdale private strip here. Yeah. And I'm taking them out to like, this is like 50 minutes, like out to Anthem. And then you yeah. get out there and you're, you're never getting a ride back. So... My car was like, I'm like, I don't know if this is worth it. When you bring everything in, the wear and tear on the vehicle, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm on the losing end. I never got tips. Like, never. <laughs> Nobody ever tipped. Like, the only one tip that I got was this. He was a drunk college kid. Nice enough kid or whatever. He's like, I, I had him sit up front. And, you know, he was kind of loud. He was drunk. Not terrible, but he was drunk. And so just bullshitting with him or whatever. And then he tried to pull the <laughs> So he's like, drop him off or whatever. He's like, hey, thanks, man. And he hands me a signal. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, man. I go, you know what? Don't worry Keep about it. it, dude. This is just a fun thing for me, man. You need it more than I do. I go, go get yourself a shot or something. Like, it's all good. He's like, no, no, no. I go, don't, no, dude. Please. You're in college. Like, I don't want your fucking money. <laughs> hideous women in Scottsdale, too. Just hideous, right? Oh, just, yeah. 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 Call me more importantly, what was your Uber rating? Hi. It was good. I was a good driver. I was a good driver. Like I had people, I would look if, you know, sometimes drivers like you get in and if you're not in the mood to talk and now they have like the conversation option or whatever, but you know, sometimes like I was good. I was like, look, if somebody got in the car, you know, whether it was a guy or, you know, I'd be polite, but if they didn't want to talk, I just shut my mouth and took them to wherever they wanted to go. But if they wanted to chat. I would chat. I didn't mind like, cause I'm doing this for fun. Like, you know, in two minutes, if somebody orders, 
two minutes later or whatever it is, you can leave, get the fare, and, you know, if, if that's considered late. But, like, I'm sitting there. I'm like, what the fuck's the difference if it's two minutes or ten? Like, I'm not doing anything anyways. I got nowhere to go. So my rating was high. <laughs> wasn't five, but it was, like, 4.9 something. Some asshole didn't give me a five. <laughs> I think it was Razor. Didn't give you a five. Yeah. <laughs> no I should do that again, though. I like driving, so. Yeah. All right, Hershey. All You're right. our guest, so I feel like at some yeah. point we got to get some stories and prime yeah. out of you. And I, uh, look, we just hit the 30th anniversary here in the last several weeks of, you know, for me, like, man, like that Lillehammer Olympics in 94 – that was magical, man. Like you really, you know, cemented in terms of, you know, you kind of became a household name for, I think, every Canadian watching at that particular time uh, to go on that run. Like I'm looking at your numbers from that, like you had 930 save percentage in the Olympics. Like if there was ever a time to shine, like that's the moment. But I, I like looking at that roster, it was sneaky good. Like I, I felt like a kind of a collection of, of, you know, who are these people? And, you know, obviously the NHLers weren't going there in 94. But, like, looking back, you have Paul Correa, Peter Nedved. Then you got, like, Adrian O'Coin, Chris Terry. Like, it's kind of a sneaky good roster. Brian Savage, Chris Contos, who had that huge playoff run. Like, there were, there were like, looking back now, it's like, man, that's a pretty good team. But at the time, it was like, who are these guys? Yeah, we were the last year that amateurs went. And this is this is the cool thing about that is, is that, you know, they split the summers and the winters. So they've had a, a Winter Olympics in 92 and then another one in 94 because they wanted to That's right, sport. yeah, yeah. If they don't do that, I don't ever play in the Olympics. Uh, Tom Rennie's the head coach for the national team. I mean, if he doesn't get that job, like like so many, you as you guys know, Kami and Razor, so many things have to happen. You know, there's guys that will play in the NHL like Bedard and McDavid and Greg. They'll just, they're good enough. But for guys that were like journeymen or get just like so many things have to line up in place. Coaches have to like you, uh, you know, and that was kind of the story with the Olympics. And then that goddamn Peter Forsberg. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. No, but, you know, we were, stand. we were pretty we're good. <laughs> it's, you know what? Um, at least it was a good player, right? Oh, great player. <laughs> yes, yes, so, yes. So we weren't that good going into the Olympics. Uh, we had we had, a, we had an average team and then we got Korea and Nedved at Christmas and they just, they, they'd made our team a completely different team. Then we just caught fire at, at the Olympics. Um, and it was, yeah, Lillehammer was, it was magical. It was, it was amazing. Um, and then obviously got all the way to the finals, the shootout, uh, before Forsberg shot, the coach asked Hawk and Lube and Mats Naslund if they would shoot because they were veteran older players, right? Stanley cup winners. And they didn't want to shoot. And that's when Peter Forsberg went, I'll shoot. And so he came down on me and did the little loop de loop. And then uh, Korea missed. Uh, we ended up with silver, but you know, silver's not that bad. Both, both, Mats, Nas, both Mats Naslin and Hack and Lube were asked to go, and, and that's they the wouldn't shoot, they're too nervous. And like uh, guys who were like the face of like two Canadian friends, like Mats Naslin was like Mr. Montreal. Uh, Razor, you were a half fan at one time, like Mats Naslin, was a rock Mats Naslin. star, absolutely. And, and then Hack and Lube was you know right up there for the leading scorer for the Flames for years. In the yeah, they still talk about him in Calgary, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hershey, a couple things. One is I'm you you played at Sweden at the end. So I'm curious how you're received in Sweden um, yeah. because of that. And but my and another real important question, I think, and I I I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but as a former goalie, has that goal gotten better as time has gone past? And do you feel now, 20 years later, like how cool it is to be a part of that? At the time, you're like, oh, my God, you know, I'm on a postage stamp. But as you get further away from it, I, from my point of view, I think it's cooler to be a part of that. You're remembered more because of that in the history of hockey for winning silver rather than just win, losing 3 nothing in the silver in the gold medal game. No one would remember. Is, it, is, is that your point of view from that now? Oh yeah. Oh, it gives me the opportunity to do what I do today. Right. Yeah. I mean, I became yeah, exactly. kind of a household name and I, I speak on mental health and I'm able to do that. And I tell the story, uh, during my talk. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very thankful for it. Um, and it was, it was a great moment in, in hockey history. And, uh, yeah. So when I played in Sweden at the end of my career, 
Um, I'm on the stamp, of course. And uh, I, I, I had a I had a bad, didn't have a very good period. I think we were down like three nothing after the first. And I don't know, we're at Lexand or something. And I'm coming off the ice and some fans yelling, the stamp, the stamp, heckling me. And I looked up and I said, hey, buddy, every time you use that fucking stamp, you know you're licking my ass, right? And then, uh, <laughs> he didn't have much to say after that. <laughs> so that that was um that that was yeah that was one of the good ones where you get it back but i love sweden if you if you told me i had to live there and play i'd be like yeah okay you know it was what a great stockholm is one of my favorite cities in the world uh oslo i lived uh, i played in malmo just across from denmark and copenhagen i don't know if you guys have been there but i mean that i was I, awesome I everybody to I go there, yeah, they? yeah nice. they, they're just great cities and razor didn't you play in italy yeah, Malmo? I was in Italy as well. I was in I was in Sweden. I was up north in um, Umia, so I played Malmo three or four times a year. Um, you so were I was way all up over the country. Yeah, I was way up north, way, way, way up north. So oh, the, the exact the opposite of Malmo. Yeah. No, February, you didn't see the sun at all. So I was up there. It was awesome. I love Sweden, like yeah, you just isn't, said. Isn't I'll it move a, there in a minute. Great. Played, uh, easy country. Uh, yeah. When I was in Columbus the one year, we went and played, uh, like, what do they call the global premier games oh, or yeah. whatever? So yeah. we're playing the sharks in the um in the globe in the globe, yeah. Right? Is that what it's called? Now, yeah. now it's the Avici yeah. Arena. It's the Avici okay. Arena. Oh, that's right. That's right. It used it's to be the globe. There? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so we played an exhibition game. We're playing against the Sharks. We're playing our first two regular season games there. But before that, we played an exhibition game against the Malmo Red Hot Hawks. Yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah. okay. So we played them in Malmo. So we went down to Malmo and played. I scored a goal. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, it was, uh, I went to just tee up this one timer and it, and the thing jumped on me or I missed or whatever. It was like the biggest change up ever, like fooled the goalie because it was so <laughs> slow. But whatever. Uh, but my memories from they were playing like because it wasn't a big game for them. I think their team was decent. So they like dressed, which I get it. So they dressed some kids. So they had like full, yeah, yeah, full, full masks on. So yeah. I think they were under 18 or under whatever it is. Yeah. They were they were really young. We're playing this, and I'm like, Jesus! I'm like, we're playing against like fucking kids that I would have played against when I played for the Fort Saskatchewan Traders, for Christ's sakes! Like they had some vets and stuff, but anyways, so it was it was a decent game or whatever. But I will never forget. You guys remember the name Rotislav Klesla? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 Rusty, yeah. big Rusty. Rusty. He got fanuffed uh, in the World Juniors the one year I think. Got he did, and he got fanuffed in this game too. I always think of it. <laughs> this game was like over, and like. I think Rusty, Rusty, great guy. You know, every once in a while on the ice, he would make some plays, and I was like, "What?" The? Anyways, we all had to make mistakes, but we were in there. We're basically playing against kids, and Rusty comes around the net, and I don't know. He had somebody literally right there, just past the puck, like that's easiest play on earth. You do it a million times in practice, and he like tried to do some like fake kind of turn back thing. And he had his head down and turned right into this young kid with a face mask. And this kid was flying. And you want to talk about getting fanuff. I don't know if I've ever seen somebody get hit so fucking hard. And this is like a defenseman making three million bucks playing in the National Hockey League against some 16-year-old. Like, I mean, I thought Rusty was fucking dead. I was on the bench. I'm like, oh, my God. But then it's like. I, nobody even could really get mad because, like, man, this kid's 16. Like, that was a terrible play by Rusty. What are you doing? Like, anyway, it's the first thing I think of when I hear Momo. I'm like, bless Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. that was, hey, wait, wait, we, just quickly, just quickly on, on, on going back to the Olympic goal. I mean, that was the first time I think the hockey universe saw that goal. Like that move had had you ever oh, seen shootout like, really even like in any yeah in the in the shootout but like had you ever had anybody ever tried something like that even just goofing around and practice like that was the first time yeah. I mean you know the Forsberg right I mean you still see it come out from time to time in in shootouts but like that yeah. was the first time the world ever saw a new goal or a, you know a deke like that it was just unheard of at the time well and I I got mentioned on Hockey Night in Canada the other night again by Kelly Rudy. So it's like, it, it, I live in infamy of, of this goal. Right. And I was, uh, I was with the Canucks. Uh, and you're I was not the me. only one though, in the 30 years since this though. Right. No. And every time I get my name mentioned, which is good, it keeps me relevant in history. Right. Yeah. So I was the radio guy for the Canucks and Pedersen scored in a, in a shootout, uh, like that. So Petey comes on the air after and I'm, I'm interviewing him. I'm like, Hey, Petey, uh, you know what that goal is called? 
uh, Canucks had won on it or something. And he's like, yeah, it's called the Forsberg. And I'm like, do you know who he scored on? And he's like, no. I'm like, Petey, that was me. All right. And Peterson was like, oh, fuck, you know. The young punks don't even know, right? So, um, no, right. apparently Kent Nielsen did it, someone said, like years before, but not on a big stage like that. But for him to have the balls to do it, um, I thought I had him. Like, he come come to my like, – I, I was like – I'd lined up. I was like, I got him. Like, I, oh, I had yeah, him. Perfect. And that's, that's the beauty of the goal. It's perfectly set up. Like, you, yeah. you'll never see it set up so well again. Yeah, and I, you know, I was more of a stand-up style goalie. So if I, if I'd had to go into the splits to get it, they wouldn't have. They'd have been picking me up off the ice, anyways, right? <laughs> Better to take so, silver. Better oh, to take yeah. silver than that. <laughs> well, if you're not first, you're last, right, Ricky Bobby? <laughs> what, how, do you like, uh, how do you like? You're, you're doing speaking tours and stuff. Now, yeah, right. Yeah, how so do you enjoy yeah. that. Like, do you like doing the speaking? Like, I've had some opportunities to, not in, in like, just more like not hot stove, but get up and speak in front of him. And to me, I'm like, man, I, just to get up there and speak is something I'm not real comfortable with. Like Q and a stuff's fine. Do, do you enjoy the speaking? Were you nervous when you first started? I mean, I imagine you were a little bit the first time doing anything, but do you enjoy yeah, it. I, I, I do. You know what? I, I enjoy being able to like help people with my story and um, I, I mental health is a tough topic. So I, I put some hockey stuff in there. I got the Forsberg video. I've got some, you know, video of Mario scoring on me a thousand times in the garden when I was like 20 years old. Um, so I got a bunch of stuff in it, but yeah, Kami, I, I, I like it. It's um, it, like I said, it's, you can't, you can't fuck up your own story, right? Like when I was first going to, to do it, I was like, I talked to Clint Malarchuk. I'm like, I'm a little nervous about doing this. He's like, Hershey, you can't fuck up your own story. So, and he's right. So I go up there, I tell my story, uh, but I don't just tell my story. I try to educate it a little bit too, because you know, like uh, I, I had a suicide attempt while I was playing in the National Hockey League. This is, you know, a month, two months after the Olympics, drank out of the Stanley Cup. And two weeks later, I'm, I'm finding myself, you know, uh, on a mountain uh, in my car, you know, wanting to end it all. So, um, of course, you know, I'm still here, which I'm thankful for. Um, but I was never educated on that stuff in school. Right. And it would have been so easy to, to teach me. So instead, I ended up. Um, just suffering in silence for years because I didn't want anybody to know. Right. I mean, heaven forbid your goalie, my NHL career, all that, but, it, but eventually, um, you know, it, it took me down and I'll, I'll tell the story uh, quickly here. And I've told other because I, I encourage people to go get help. There's no, there's no need to, but uh, uh, I got traded to Vancouver from New York. Um, this is after, after making a suicide attempt because they kind of thought I was a bad guy, right? Because you're, you're late for stuff. You're not really present. You start withdrawing from the guys, all stuff that are mental health issues. But I end up in Vancouver, but I play pretty well. Um, I end up on the NHL rookie team, but I'm sick. Like, I'm sick. And I tell people this for people that think that people with mental health issues are, are weak. I mean, I made the NHL, right? Like with one and Michael Phelps, you look at those guys. But it all kind of comes crashing down in my second year in Vancouver um, I lost like 30 pounds. I was 145 pounds trying to play. I was only 175. I was going in the shower once I was coming out. Marty Jelena looks at me and goes, Hershey, what's wrong with you? And I didn't want anybody to know, right? And I'd been suffering now for about three years, panic attacks, um, you know, suicidal ideations. So we play in New York on the island one night, and then we got to play back to back in New Jersey. And I got to play all the games because Kirk McLean's hurt. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm back on my knees again, like where I'm having regular panic attacks. I'm suicidal. Uh, I get up in the morning of the Islanders game and I'm like, fuck, I can't do this anymore. Like, I just can't. So I'm like, OK, I got two choices. I can either reach out to a trainer because I can't do this anymore and see if there's help or plan B. Fuck it. Just get it done. Right. And my thought process, so sick I was, my thought process was, all right, I'll, I'll see if there's help. And if there isn't, doesn't matter. I'm not going to be around anyways. Right. So I go to the rink for the morning skate against the Islanders. I play against, uh, or I pull Mike Bernstein way away from the players. I'm like, Bernie, uh, I'm not doing very well. And he's like, yeah, Hershey, we can tell, right? I'm fucking I'm 140. I'm skin and bones. Right. Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I'm like, no, Bernie, I'm suicidal. And he's like, his face just goes blank. He's like, holy shit. Uh, okay. He says, you got to play. Can you get yourself ready to play? I'm like, yeah, I can. I can do that. Uh, he says, let me work on this. So I go play against the Islanders that night. Terrible. We lose 5-4. Overtime goals, the shits. I get in a fight. Um, 
you know, after the game, my teammates are looking at me. Now they're really starting to fucking hate me because like, they don't know what's going on. I'm not telling anybody. Right. right. Yeah. So the next morning we bus to Jersey or we bus that night to Jersey. We got a morning skate bus from the hotel and uh, in the morning skate, um, I got to play again that night and I can't see pox like where guys are shooting and I'm having like what's called depersonalization. It's you're having like an out of body experience. The brain's just it's fried. It's just the pot's boiled over like computer's fried. So I'd never pulled myself from a game. And that point I, I skate over to Tom Rainey. I say, Tom, I, I, I can't play. Right. Like I, I can't do this anymore. I'm just, I'm a fucking disaster. He says, okay, here she go get changed in the locker room. I got this. So I go get changed in the locker room. I come back in the locker room. Tom calls an emergency meeting. So in the locker room, I'm sitting in the corner with my head and my knees, like a uh, shell of a human being. All my teammates are in the, like Pavel Bure, Russ Courtnell, Trevor Linden. They're all wondering what the fuck's going on. Right. Um, and Tom says, uh, her, she's not doing very well. Mike Fountain's going to play. Um, you know, uh, if anybody asks in the media, just tell me he's got the flu. Right. Like just fucking nobody knew what to do. Swept under the carpet. So one of the most embarrassing, humiliating moments of my life, I go have a shower. I get in the shower. I'm the plague now. Like fucking guys don't even want it. Like they're like, holy shit. Like, is this catchable? So I go back, I get on the bus to go to the hotel and I sit at the front of the bus and my teammates are rolling by me one by one. And I'm like, I just threw away my NHL career. And it, honestly, at that point, 1996, I did right. Nobody understood that. But I, I remember looking out the window and I had a tear rolling down my face and, uh, um, I did. I threw my NHL career away, but it was also the same day I saved my own life. I went back to Vancouver. They had a psychologist come to my apartment and my thought process was the same. Fuck it. I'll tell this guy everything. If there's no help, plan B, it's not going to matter. I'm not going to fucking be here anyways. Right. So I tell him I spew my guts out to the psychologist. I'd never seen a psychologist before. Like, like I didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, he looks at me and after about 20 minutes, he goes, uh, you have obsessive compulsive disorder. And I'm like, what what the hell is that he's like well it's a mental health issue it's not curable but it's treatable we'll get you on some medication therapy you know you'll be on your way you're gonna have a great life and i just sat there and i bawled in front of him i was like fucking three years of my life gone because i didn't ask for help because i was too scared to ask for help right because of all yeah. the stuff that we could talk about um and then, actually, nobody but nobody i mean generations yeah. of this in terms of suffering and silence you know suck it up right like yeah, absolutely the idea, the idea of mental health you know in in the 1990s it was unheard of i mean really only in the last 15 years we or even 10 years for that matter do we have a little more acceptance or understanding of what's going on from a mental health standpoint well yeah and it's you know like i mean i almost ended up dead like why are we not teaching our kids this stuff still and i i don't want to we'll bring the podcast back up i don't want to drag it down into the but um, oh, this is real life though no, this is good you know, Kami, and this is what I say in, in Razor when I when I talk, when I do my talks to kids and all these people, I'm like, you know, the whole masculinity thing, there's a difference, you know, there's a war on masculinity, and I don't like it, but there's a difference between being an asshole and being a man, you know, like there's a huge difference. But anyway, so, and I say this, you know, like we were all taught to suck it up. And I, I say, if, if I ended up successful killing myself, do you think my teammates would have come to my funeral and said, what a man, he sucked it up. Fuck, good for him. He went out like, no, Tommy, you guys, you guys would be like, well, why didn't he say anything? Why, why did we, we could have helped him. Right. So we, we got to throw that BS. And just my thing is, is that I say, you know what? Ask for help. There's no shame in it. You can still be a man and ask for help. It gets better when you do, there's no need to suffer in silence. Um, and that, that's my whole message is, is like, you know, fuck the man shit. Like, go get help and be be a buddy that, that somebody can talk to, right? Like, like Kami, I, you know, and, and Razor, like, honestly, I, I, I know you guys and I don't know you real well, but I know you pretty well. Fuck, I'd call you up and just say, hey, I'm not doing great if I was in Scottsdale. I, you know, you guys are good guys and you're people that, you know, that, that guys can talk to. And you got it. That, that's what you, you know, that's what you need. But like I said, I don't want to bring the pod down, but no. hey, the story gets better. I'm still here, right? Three yeah. kids, right? Yeah. I'm proof that it gets better. So, um, yeah, I wrote a book about it. Um, and the cool thing was too, is, is that, uh, I played in my first NHL game at Joe Louie arena and, uh, I have a picture. I took my boys hockey team there the last year. It was, um, the last year it was standing. And, uh, before they tore it down, I took his hockey team to a game and 
fuck, man, that would have never happened, right? Like you, I, there was a day I couldn't see it tomorrow, and you just fuck, you just got to get to tomorrow. Sometimes, you know, it yeah. gets better. I, I I promise you, it it does. It gets better. Um, let's take this in a different direction. Let's tell some hockey stories. Fuck. <laughs> there you go. Important message. Let's tell some Babcock stories. Oh. No. Yeah. <laughs> he, fucking, he comes on my pod too like he's the mental health guy like fucking are you you're, you're fucking kidding me you know uh, now like, that's, that's the one yeah like the fact that he was like uh, i mean the guys are i mean at least some of it has come out now and he's i think people that pay attention a little bit are like okay hey, this guy's a fucking fraud i mean if you just read the articles from the time he got hired whatever july 4th and whatever it was in columbus and read i read a couple of them just i'm like look at this shit and <laughs> when you read like just the two months worth of, worth of articles and all the bullshit that came out of this guy's mouth and then you, you find out what he was doing or at least what they there was a lot more going on that hasn't come out but whatever i mean the fact that he was like a mental health advocate was like the biggest joke ever yeah, it was a total cool. disservice because he's like you know, he's selling himself. Well, I, I, mental health is very important to me. And meanwhile, as soon as the cameras are off, he's just fucking terrorizing people. Yeah. Um, Tommy, that was the one thing I thought a lot of guys like, you know, there was a, a huge feature about, I think he was with the Leafs at the time, but that he was doing his part to help as a mental health advocate, Mike Badpo Babcock. But I remember one player calling me just like livid, saying like, this is the biggest fucking fraud ever. Yeah. In terms of how, you know, who is this guy? Like the biggest bully behind the scenes to say, hey, I'm here for you. Oh, yeah. we are, and we all have, we all have a, at least one coach like that, Razor. Sure. I don't know who yours was, oh, yeah. but, but mine's first initial is an M and his last name starts with a C. You guys can fucking figure it out from there. Mm -hmm. you know? But um, yeah, and I'm not the only one that feels that no, way. You're not. No. Yeah. They, and worse, you know, worse than other guys that I had, like starts with an M, ends with a Starts with a K the last day. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to fucking mention any names. I was playing uh, 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 fucking Mike Keenan. I played in, I remember in Detroit. Razor, you played in, in Joe Louie, right? You, yeah, I had Keenan oh, too. Oh, you did too. Okay, so yeah. as the backup, you sit on that stool in, yeah. in, in Detroit. My yeah. skates are rubbing against the steel. All like I got fucking butter. Like Snowy's made 40 saves going into the third period. Detroit scores two quick goals. It's fucking two to one. Keenan comes over. Hey, get in there. I look at him and go, are you fucking kidding me? Right? I've got a hot dog. I've had popcorn, right? So I go, I, I skate in the net and Snowy's like, what the, Snowy's like, what the fuck? Building, ice is tilted. Like, remember when we used to walk past oh. the boiler room? Yeah. The game? I swear they had like a crank in there where the ice is. <laughs> They're skating down. Oh, it but, wasn't like Snowy was uh, a wallflower either. Oh yeah, no, I know that. That's so, fun going to pull him yourself. I contributed to five more goals against. We lost fucking seven to two. That was <laughs> the end of that one. Yeah, that was it. And the game before, he pulled Snowy halfway through the second period. We were down four two <laughs> to Toronto, and he pulled Snowy halfway through. We played five minutes without a goalie. Right, he's <laughs> Toronto. Yeah, <laughs> Keenan was like him and Burke were having a feud, and he it was like a fuck you to Brian. Oh, Burke, get me some players. Oh, it was like just a shit show. Like it was like well, and that's yeah. You had Mike too, eh? Yeah, Keenan yanked me in the garden in in the Madison Square Garden. Uh, I was with Bruins. I was twenty years old. One goal on eight shots. Uh, the first goal went in six minutes into the game. He pulled me. <laughs> we're down one nothing. We were down one nothing. He yanked me after eight shots. I was like, oh, fuck, perfect. I like Mike's philosophies on winning. Like he 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 was a good coach, but he couldn't help himself. From yeah. taking it a step further, yeah. and I never seen him yell, never seen him freak out. Very calm, but just fucking one step further with everybody. You know, it was like, but I didn't, I didn't. You know, I was there in New York when when they won the cup in '94, so I saw, you know, I saw what they did there. Which was well, are you? So in that '94, I wanted to ask you about that. So that '94, I mean, I look back. We're coming up on the 30th anniversary of that Canucks Rangers Stanley Cup final. I mean, I didn't have a dog in the hunt at that time. But that, to me, I look back, like, that's one of the greatest Stanley Cup finals ever. Like, that series was insane. And yeah. you're basically, you're one of the aces for the Rangers at that time. Yeah. Like, what a root. Like, look at that room. Like, that Rangers team. I mean, I mean, the Canucks had a stacked roster as well. But, 
I mean, mess. I mean, it was basically Oilers East, right? Uh, from all those eighties, uh, all those guys from the eighties. The garden was like the just fucking going nuts. Like it, what a what a great place, and it was um, it was something else to see. I it was it was, and then when they won, it was like relief over the city. There was no riots or anything like that. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was fucking, it was unbelievable what they did, especially 54 years, right. In New York city. And like, I watched that whole thing. Richter was, was ridiculously good, but that was the last year. I think not the last year, but then Jersey went on to win some cups. But when you watch that finals, there is hooking and holding and there's fucking, but, but it was good hockey, right? It was like, you had to fight through everything, both teams. And and now not like the game we know, they had to take out a lot of that shit. We know the head stuff, the concussions, right? Like it had to happen, but the game, there's no hitting anymore in the game. And if someone does throw a big hit, it's fucking, there's a big fight, you know, like don't hit anybody. But you know, back then that was, that was the last year I thought that there was fucking real, real battles. Um, you know, and to your point, Hershey too, right? Like Brian Leach was still doing three spinoramas and Pavel Burry was still going a hundred million miles an hour. It like within all of the physicality and the hooking and holding, there's still the, the beauty of the game that we have now is just a perfect balance. You go, I mean, there's nothing better than watching the 94 series. You go straight to that for, for the best hockey, you know, the last 50 years. Now, Kami, did you play against Gretzky? No, I missed him. I turned well, pro right after. Razor, you wouldn't have either, right? I missed him, yeah. yeah. I caught Gretzky at the end of his career, um, and I caught Mario right in the middle of it. And Mario just was – like, today Mario would have 400 oh points God. in the NHL. He's ridiculous. 6'3", you know, could do it all. And so anyone that asked me, they're like, who was better, Gretzky? Well, I caught Mario in the middle, right? So, it, to me, Mario was – I mean, Gretzky, obviously – the greatest player in the game, but I have a, a quick Gretzky story for you too. So um, I, I'd never met Wayne and I was golfing with Russ at a, a, a at Sherwood in, uh, in LA yep. and prestigious. I, I was doing the radio for the Canucks. We had a couple of days off. I flew down to LA to ru- golf with Russ and Gretzky comes around nine and I come, we come around 18 and the T boxes match up. Right. So he, I'm like, Russ, holy shit. That's Gretzky. They're best friends. You've got to introduce me to him. And Russ is like, stop fucking fanboy, and you're embarrassing me in front of Wayne, right? <laughs> Clubhouse after. So I'm like, whoa. So I'm, I'm going to meet Gretzky. So I barely hit my ball down 18. So I get in the clubhouse. I'm talking like sitting right beside Gretzky, talking to him. Like he's such a good dude. Have you guys met him? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The best. He's just, such a, he's just a good human being, right? Just, a, just wants to talk hockey, wants to know every goal he scored, right? So I talked to him for about 45 minutes and I'm like, I got to catch a flight back to LA. And I'm like, ah, you know, talk to him. So I got to go. I get up. I say, Hey Wayne, it was really nice to meet you. I don't get a photo because Russ doesn't want me to fanboy. I'm still, (laughs) but I get up, I shake, he gets up, I shake his hand. He's like, Hey, wait a second. Did I ever play against you? And I'm like, yeah, my first NHL win was in the forum uh, against the LA Kings. I played against you that night. He's like, did I score on you? And I'm like, no, you didn't. And I know you lose sleep at night over it. I got a psychiatrist for you if you need one. And I was leaving. I went, oh my God, what did I just do? I just blew my And Russ said he fucking loved it. He was dying laughing. Oh, First, he's the only goal I never scored on. I never met him. Haven't seen him since. Doesn't answer my calls, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but what a great human being! Hey, like just fucking what a, he's like. He's did like, you get what, one? Did you give one up on Mario? Gave up three in the Garden on on Mario, and then about four hundred more in Pittsburgh. They played for the Rangers. <laughs> they were always playing against each other. But right. the year that they were going for the sixteenth win in a row, right? Uh, yeah. It was win regulation. The Rangers weren't doing very well. They threw me in net. I was playing in the minors. It was my fourth NHL game. You know, Mario's probably licking his lips in the garden. Look at I'm like five foot ten, 155 pounds. <laughs> Mario's like, so Mario, you know, he lit me up for three. And then uh uh and then he lit Richter up for two more. They won like we had like five goals in the game. Um, you know, what a what a what a player he was. I didn't play in the NHL for two more years after that. Um <laughs> <laughs> what a player he was jesus christ you got did you guys i didn't did you guys play against mario i forgot to oh, i got it? mario you I got, got mario. mario yeah but that was like it was when he was coming back from his back and he was like just doing it to to get the team i think but i played uh i played two periods against him in pittsburgh yeah. one night so i got i got that too, one. like i did or did you finish <laughs> the game 
No, no, no. He didn't finish the game. It was his bat. Like it was, it, they were rolling him out. You know, that was when guys were tying to skates at that point. It was like oh, 02. Christ. I think it was an 02 I played against him. But, yeah. but again, he took a sh- couple shots on me. So I got that. Yeah, just fucking big and strong. Oh, I, big. I see him like, like, once a year now, Ruzioni, and it's just like, this guy's the best. He's got like fucking guys hanging off his back. Remember, you ever watched the Flintstones episode where Fred Flintstone goes back to high school and he's like the running back for, I don't know if you guys are too young, but he's got all these little kids hanging off his back. And he's, <laughs> that's what Mario reminds me of, right? Like he just, today's game, he would just absolutely dominate. Oh. I think anyways, but. I played a couple games against him. But yeah. one I remember is, uh, <clears throat> it was like the first game where I was, I was in New Jersey. It was one of my, I think it was my first year or whatever. Yeah, it was my first. Larry Robinson was the coach. I got off to like, for me, a pretty decent start. So this was like game, I don't know, four or five of my career maybe. And I get to the rink and they got the lineup up. Well, I'm on the top pairing. It's me and Scott Stevens. And we're in the igloo there. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, this is a, <laughs> this is a yeah, big yeah. game for me. What am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, hey, Larry's like, ready for tonight? You're going to be Lemieux, Yager, Straka. I'm like, yeah, I'm ready. In my head, I'm like, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> I probably am not. First two periods go by. We're winning the game. I want to say like maybe like 3-1 or something like that. Well, Scott and I are on fire. Like we're like maybe plus one, shutting them down, second intermission. I'm like, I'm the man. I'm like, fuck these guys. I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. I am here to stay. Third period rolls around. Those three decide to turn it up. I remember one puck going through my legs for a breakaway to Yager. When you pass it to Yager, that was a minus. I think I got scored on like, I mean, it was at least three times, maybe four. They were the first stars of the game. We lost the game five to three. I'm like, fuck, maybe I'm not ready. (laughs) (laughs) Guys are pretty good. All right, last question, Kami. Who'd you score on your first NHL goal on? Uh, Kevin Weeks. Kevin, Kevin Weeks. Weeks in Tampa Bay. Weeks. Uh, yeah. It was probably uh I played in three pro leagues, and in every pro league, I scored in my second game, the American League, the NHL, and the KHL. Wow. Uh yeah, yeah, kind of weird. That's good. And yeah. Ray, who scored their first who scored with the first goal you got scored on? Rob Niedermeyer. Yeah. Powell Burry, wrister off the wall, power play, Rob Niedermeyer tip between my legs. Yeah. Mine mm-hmm. was Jimmy Carson, blew one by me in Detroit. Slap Jimmy shot. Carson. Didn't Jimmy even Carson. Yeah. They should give the goalies the first puck they ever got. Yeah, yeah, to give up and who <laughs> scored it, what yeah. time. The whole That's a great call. You're right. It's, that's better or just as good as, like, your first win, first shutout, first goal against is, like, yeah. you know, you and want someone crazy. good scoring on you, like Jimmy Carson. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my first NHL shutout was in Boston. I got – it was a Fox track puck. Oh, cool. Yeah, I got a that's Fox track cool. money. Yeah. yeah. You know – just because you brought that up, and we got to wind down on on this here, Hershey. But I'm going to throw this out to you guys now. I had this conversation. Maybe there was the influence of, you know, various, uh, you know, extracurriculars uh, the other night with my neighbor. But we were watching golf the other night, and with the technology now in terms of tracking the ball, and Kami, you'll appreciate this. Would the fox puck tracker have value in terms of the advent of technology now, 30 years later? Would there not be value in terms of using that, tracking some shots now in hockey? Where like everybody was outraged, but it was a different time, a different generation. I don't think the technology was quite there yet. But man, to think back, how progressive that actually is when you look at other sports maximizing the technology and graphics. Like, would the Fox Puck work now in today's NHL, guys? I think for replays. Not, but it would have to be like it was a big, like, big request, like a flame coming out the back. Yeah, like, yeah, it was a little like, much. It was a little much. In line, right? On yeah. replays, I, I wouldn't mind seeing that, but not like sure. look off the tee box now, Kami. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For golf, it's like we, now when you watch golf, it's yeah, if they don't send don't that have line, the tracker, it's like, like oh, this, this sucks. Why? What's the point? You see the guy swing, which is great, <laughs> but you can't see the fucking ball. But it's yeah. cool to see from behind, like, yeah. You know, no, he hit a like, cut. Could, but could that not translate thing. now to to hockey in terms of the advent of te- with the advancement of technology now and the graphics? Razor, you work on the on Nesson broadcast. Like, yeah, yeah, you? no, I think uh, like Hershey said, I think the replays would be kind of cool if you, you. But I think it would be it's still distracting in a regular tee to see that blue line flying across the puck move. Because don't forget, see ball the puck's moving fifty times faster than it did in the Fox puck, you know, whatever yes, the era was sure. too. So. 
that thing's bouncing around. The TVs are better. Um, but I, there, there's probably somewhere there for, for replay or, you yeah. know, they've got the 80 mile an hour shot going and the whole thing. It's, it, it, but it is amazing that the NHL was way ahead of things at that time. It's actually impressive for the NHL. Right. I mean, you look at like Good first point. down, you know, the first, you got the yellow first down line that uh, you see in NFL games, right. That we're all accustomed to now. We kind of rely on, yeah. I mean, all these different virtual lines. So anyway, maybe it's for replays, but I just wanted to put that out there. Hershey, thank you so much for doing this. Um, thank you. I, I will I'll, I'll leave this for anybody that, that is just looking for some guidance and direction. Is there somewhere they can go to contact? What What would you say for anybody who, who you know, who yeah. hasn't had that sort of advice or perspective or needs someone to talk to? First place you go is your family doctor, right? You get, or you talk to a friend or whatever. Those are the first places you go. Um, you know, there's all sorts of hotlines, suicide hotlines in Canada. We have kids help phone for anybody, but yeah, man, go get the help. Like there's, there's no shame in it. Um, you know, and, and I'm living proof that, that it gets better. And we all have shit, you know, we all got something going on, commie yeah. razor, the sea ball, like we all got stuff, man. And there's no shame in getting help. It's actually makes you a man when you go to get help. So, uh, if you want to reach me, Corey, her 72 on Instagram, uh, if you got any questions, I got uh, my book saving my life. Uh, and I got, uh, my website is, uh, Corey So thanks guys for having me. Uh, what an can we awesome buy stamps? Can we buy stamps on the on the website? I don't know. You might be able to. I got a, I got a few. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> you <know what> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you just did. Uh, there he is. Uh, the one, the only Corey Hirsch joining us here on the Clearing the Crease podcast.